Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Vicky. Appreciate it. And uh, also the great overview that was given by Sabine uh, early on of, of Nokia. So good afternoon from my side, uh, dear members of European Parliament. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. So we're at a point where European political leadership and a clear-headed approach to the social and economic challenges of a connected world are more important than ever, I believe. Your work is vital for Europe at a time of great change, at a time when the world is watching very carefully. But before talking about those challenges, which I love to talk about, and I can get carried away with them, so I'll, I'll begin with some more detail on the Nokia of today, to follow on from the earlier introductory remarks. I imagine many of you have uh, fond memories of Nokia over the years. The brand has been formidable as a consumer brand from its days as the world's largest producer of mobile phones. I bet that many of you uh, had your first mobile phone as uh, Nokia. Certainly hope so. It has been quite a journey since then. We have transformed our networks business through the acquisition of the Siemens share of uh, the joint venture in Nokia Siemens networks uh, that we did not own. And in April last year, we completed the sale of uh, the devices and services business to Microsoft. So basically, the core business became non-core, the non-core went out. <clears throat> We have reinvented the company to be a profitable technology powerhouse and a leader in the European business. Since those first mobile phones appeared, the ICT industry has grown to become a massive global business. So let's consider this. Last year, on average, 67,000 images were uploaded on Instagram, 433,000 tweets were sent, 306 hours of YouTube Videos were uploaded and over 136 million emails were sent. They're big numbers, right? But those numbers go stratospheric when I uh, tell you that they are for every minute of 2014. A lot of traffic, a lot of connectivity. Absolutely astonishing, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, while much has changed in the industry and in the world, a few things have remained constant. One of those things is Nokia. As you've heard, we've been there every step of the way since the first digital networks, the first digital standards, and the first mobile phones. We have a 150-year history. In fact, today is, uh, this year is going to be our 150th year anniversary. And we've always been proud to have a headquarters in Finland and good standing in Europe. Today, Nokia has three businesses. Nokia Networks, which provides trusted mobile connectivity infrastructure, software, and services for hundreds of operators around the world. In fact, I think we work with pretty much all the major operators and, and uh, all of the global top 10. Here is our mapping, navigation, and location intelligence business. It's branded as here. We work with global automotive brands, uh, nearly all of them, many, many of them, uh, large enterprises including SAP, FedEx, and UPS, and we provide the only credible location services alternative to Google for internet players such as Amazon, and Yahoo, Microsoft, and others. And then the third business, Nokia Technologies, which is our engine for future innovation, licensing, and intellectual property. In 2013, we spent 2.5 billion euros on research and development. And over the last 20 years, we've spent more than 70 billion euros as a company in R&D. Our ability to monetize that investment is essential to make the business case needed to justify similar spending in the future. Now, to give some idea of our scale globally, today we operate in over 120 countries with more than 60,000 employees worldwide, which includes over 23,000 in Europe. We're quite uh, present in Europe. We are one of the top 15 software companies globally and we have an industry-leading patent portfolio, especially in the wireless side, spanning around 10,000 patent families with almost a further 4,000, so altogether 14,000 patent families uh, and 4,000 being in the networks business. 
our operator customers that we work with, they serve around 4 billion consumers. So we are very much a global company. Our three businesses, they're all leaders in their respective fields. We are indeed proud to be one of the preeminent uh, technology firms in Europe. So that's a snapshot of us, but maybe more interestingly for you is our view of how the world of technology will develop from here on. You know, many people talk about the speed of change uh, today, and, and yes, our industry and, and technology can move quite fast at times. I'm sure every one of you hears a constant stream of news heralding the next big thing around the corner. From 4G to 5G, I mean, 5G is five, six years away, but many people are talking about it now. Uh, from hardware to software, from legacy systems to cloud, it can all feel pretty exhausting at times. But despite all the hype, I actually have a different view. My belief is that we are moving too slow. In fact, you know, way too slow as an industry. And nowhere is this more true than here in Europe. I know that's a, a tough message to hear and to deliver. But as I travel around the world and I see what other regions and countries are doing, the stark reality is becoming apparent. Consider the fact that in the third quarter of 2014, Europe had 14.7% of LTE, these 4G connections globally, and an even a lower part of the investment. So 14.7% of 4G connections globally compared with 43.2% in Asia, Pacific, and China, and almost 39% in the United States. So almost 90% is outside of Europe. The sad fact is that Europe, which brought the incredible revolution of GSM, remember GSM, and uh, mobile telephony to the world is falling not just behind, but falling far behind. This matters now more than ever, given that we are so close to a tipping point in this connected world, in this world of technology. All the remarkable developments of recent years, vastly better mobile networks with 4G, LTE, a plummeting cost of processing power, improved power consumption, a proliferation of sensor-laden smartphones, a shift to the cloud, and much more. All of this, they're coming together to create something new, something that we believe will be as profound as the creation of the Internet itself. Another way to look at it is the third generation of Internet. Now, that something is what we prefer to call the programmable world, a world that goes from beyond connecting people to connecting things. By 2025, we could have 50 billion connected things in the form of devices, modules, and sensors. But connectivity is only the beginning. We see a world where all those connected things, they'll be held together in extraordinary ways. Software will be the glue. Analytics, big data, and intelligence will bring meaning, and automated action and insight will bring simplicity and efficiency. Vast amount of information that is now trapped in devices will become unlocked for use in powerful ways. And, and connected devices will become so ubiquitous that they will become programmable as a system, essentially a virtual computing platform that spans the globe. Or maybe this sounds a bit uh, esoteric, uh, a bit far-fetched even. Uh, so let me give you some examples to bring it down to earth uh, to help make my point that progress is too slow. Let's start that uh, look forward with a look back. A look back to 17... 98, and the predictions made by an English cleric. It was Thomas Malthus who thought that population growth was going to be limited by the ability of the earth to sustain that population. The Green Revolution in Agriculture, which began around 150 years later, was the start of an answer to Malthus and was credited with saving over 1 billion people from starvation. 1 billion people, that's a huge amount. Technology showed its power then and can do so again. We know we face many challenges in our world today. We face environmental degradation, global warming, dwindling natural resources, healthcare costs that uh, they just cost too much, leisure time that has been eroded and not helped by the always-on nature of life. Technology can help fix these things. In fact, they can be the only things that will fix these things. Take water. Large-scale water systems can typically lose about 20% in leakage before the end customer is reached. I was in China recently, 
speaking at a leadership forum there. And I pointed out that Beijing is set to use around 950 billion gallons of water annually. 20% of that is 190 billion gallons, almost two years' worth of the public water supply in Finland. So 20% of Beijing wastage can manage two years in Finland. In the future, imagine an interconnected and programmable system that links sensors and pipes in homes and industrial premises to cloud services with massive analytical capabilities. Imagine that system understanding usage trends, weather forecasts, special events that could drive demand, maintenance activities, new housing and factories coming online, and so on. Such a system could bring a whole new level of efficiency to water consumption around the world. Better capacity and demand optimization, better network and leakage management, lower unbilled water volume, and much, much more. Every month of delay in getting such a system in place means more waste of one of the world's most precious resources. From that perspective, the question is technology moving too fast or too slow? I think the answer is pretty clear. Take another example. An estimated 1.3 million people are killed as a result of road accidents every year worldwide, with more than 20,000 of those in Europe. In addition, the European Union estimates suggest that cars are responsible for about 12% of the total EU emissions of carbon dioxide, one of the main greenhouse gases. Autonomous driving, where cars effectively drive themselves without human intervention, can have a massive impact. Especially if you consider that driver error is the cause of about 90% of all car crashes. Even if you assume that autonomous driving would result in only 50% fewer annual fatalities, that would be more than half a million lives saved every year. At the same time, autonomous cars could reduce annual carbon dioxide emissions by as much as 300 million tons. But that is just about the same as half of all carbon dioxide emissions from current commercial aviation globally. But for every year that we do not have the right technology, lives are lost and pollution is increased. So, not moving fast enough. So the list of examples could go on and on. Precision agriculture that brings yields up by using big data analytics and use of harmful chemicals down. Better healthcare at lower cost, remote connected healthcare. Cloud connected devices linked to hospitals for remote monitoring of critically ill patients. And more leisure time with technology automating the many little things which have such a drain on our time today. These benefits will come. But as I suggested earlier, Europe is not on the right track to lead either the development or implementation of the technologies that will make them possible. To understand this, just spend some time in a place like Seoul in Korea. Almost five years ago, 2010, 10 of my team members were driven around Seoul in a minivan all of them streaming high-definition video on phones, tablets, and laptops at the same time. The power of that network, which has been dramatically strengthened since then, is being used for all kinds of innovation, to fuel economic growth and to improve human well-being. You know, I, I was in Korea a few weeks ago. I asked a CEO there, of uh, one of the operators, of his view on 5G. And his answer was not about technology. In fact, he didn't have a single mention of technology. It was about his vision, a simple vision, of giving back people two hours of their precious time every day. So he was more on the implication, on the opportunity. To do that, you need massive underlying efficiency and productive gains, gains that he certainly believes are possible, starting from next year. Other parts of the world are moving fast as well. China is rolling out 4G LTE networks at an extraordinary pace. In fact, it must be this biggest rollout we've ever seen since the mobile industry came to being. And as I mentioned, operators in the United States have leapfrogged their European peers. Japan is showing that profitably managing massive demand for world's densest cities is indeed possible. I know all of this probably makes me sound like I am pessimistic about Europe, but to be clear, and for the record, I am not. Concerned, yes. Healthy paranoia, yes, but 
given the rich history of innovation in this part of the world, I am absolutely 100% an optimist. Optimism, however, does not equal denial. And we cannot deny that in Brussels and in the capitals of Europe, steps need to be taken to unleash the innovation and investment needed to get things back on track. Now, I don't pretend to have all the answers. In fact, far from it. I also recognize that I approach these topics from a particular vantage point. But let me touch on some of the main policy areas that we believe are essential in order for Europe to realize success. First, the robust protection of intellectual property. There are companies out there who would like to see a weakening of the regime which protects the value of investments in innovation. Going down that path would be a massive mistake and more harmful to Europe than any other part of the world. It would mean fewer companies would have the benefit of the innovation of others and that in turn would place a new burden on the entire technology ecosystem. Without the protection of intellectual property, the incentive to invest in revolutionary technologies simply will not be there. There will not be a business case. Second, net neutrality. Let me be very direct about this topic. What is easily pitched as a pro-consumer approach to net neutrality will, in the long term, be anything but that. We believe in open access to all services at any time and at any place, for people and for businesses. That means no restricting of services and a policy regime that protects against harmful or anti-competitive discrimination of traffic. But we also believe that operators, communication providers, need to have the tools to get the value from the massive investments that they have made and continue to need to make in their networks. Of course, potential new entrants also need to see that there is a business case to be made before they take the plunge into the sector. Operators, both old and new, need to be able to insist that the rewards of network services do not get disproportionately to those who do not contribute to the costs of operating those networks. And they need to be able to manage traffic and congestion transparently, to offer different services and service levels for the benefit of their customers. For instance, in a programmable world, services like autonomous driving and remote healthcare cannot rely on a best effort internet type connection only. Specialized services and traffic management will be needed. Safety and quality will depend on it. Human lives will depend on that. Rather than viewing telecom operators largely as the opposition, they need to be viewed as absolutely core to the solution, as they are key to the future investment that will benefit others. Pro-operator and pro-consumer need not be. In fact, I don't think it cannot be. It, it cannot be mutually exclusive. Of course, European operators need to rise to the challenge as well. They need to drive the innovation of a soft bank in Japan, uh, the rising boldness of a Verizon, the ambition of a China mobile. Regulators need to ensure they have the environment to succeed, but the rest must absolutely be up to them. Third, spectrum availability. In short, <clears throat> more is needed, more capacity is needed, more traffic is needed, more of the programmable world will need more spectrum, and more is needed fast. Particularly if Europe wants to use the transition to 5G to build back its leadership in mobile communications, which I think is absolutely possible. Harmonized, affordable, and easy to trade spectrum must be released so Europe can remain competitive. You know, I welcome the stance that the European Parliament has taken in this respect, and I hope you will resist pressures from the member states to maintain the status quo keeping nearly everything under national control in the area of spectrum. This is one of those areas where union helps and fragmentation does not. Finally, trust and security, which may be the most difficult challenge we face in the coming years. For the connected world to work, people need to be able to trust the system. Trust that their credit card and personal details will not be stolen, Trust that governments will use technology to support and not degrade human rights. And trust that they are safe from hackers while being piloted around in their self-driving cars. There are no easy answers to these things. But I do believe that the solutions need to take several important aspects into consideration. First, transparency for consumers is a must. Today, 
the privacy guidelines for many companies are pretty incomprehensible, filled with far too much legal and technical jargon. We need clear, simple statements, which can be understood by mere mortal statements that enable, not obscure, consumer choice. Second, the connected world must remain a connected world, and we have to avoid the balkanization of the internet. Attempts to solve global issues through regulation that requires personal data be kept on certain servers in certain countries is simply not a solution. On the subject of data flows, I share the view of Vice President Nansip who, in outlining the vision and potential for the digital single market, he said last week, he said, my vision for a digital area is where everyone can access and carry out online activities across borders and with complete ease, safely and securely, where there is fair competition regardless of nationality or place of residence, underpinned by a clear legal structure. Well, that strikes me as an eminently smart statement which should be kept front and center as you start to consider upcoming European regulation. Third, there needs to be the right balance between privacy and legitimate government needs to protect citizens. This topic has rightly come to the forefront after the horrific events in Paris a few weeks ago. In my view, The Economist magazine put it well in a leader for their January 17th issue. Their view was that tech firms need to recognize that they cannot imperil people's lives and that a common and transparent standard for governmental access to communications is needed, but that any surveillance must require supervision and due process. That seems like a realistic, a pragmatic approach. Getting the right framework in place and getting it in place fast to address the issues of trust and security is essential if Europe wants to regain technology leadership. The reality is that many of the business models for the next generation of innovation will be built on the monetization of data and consumer data in particular. That is just a reality. And that requires a clear and transparent framework focused on the creation of an ecosystem that provides long-term, broad-based benefits. Short-term solutions that may be the easiest politically will not be, in my view, the right approach. <coughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've joined you today to acknowledge the nature of the challenges we face, and I believe our vision of a programmable world will be a driver of innovation in the ICT sector. Yes, the challenges are many, not only on the political and technological fronts, but on the social and economic fronts as well. But as I said, I'm an optimist, and I do believe that Europe has the ability, and more importantly, the attitude, to tackle these challenges head on. I've talked to you about how we at Nokia see how technology can improve people's lives. There's no doubt the programmable world can have an effect as profound as the creation of the internet itself. Our vision also builds on technology, innovation, and collaboration, qualities which are deeply rooted in Europe. And I do not want to see Europe fall behind. I want us to build on those qualities to become stronger, not weaker. I want us to be able to transform technology and not be stuck in the political doldrums. And I truly believe that if we address the challenges I have outlined this afternoon and be bold, not hesitant, it will be for great benefit, not only for Europe's 500 million citizens, but for society at large around the world. Thank you.